right. So I very much so enjoy bright colors and things. So this is going to be a very visually appealing presentation because that's who I am. Um, but I'm going to talk about the importance of communication and some different barriers that can get in the way and how to sometimes get around those specifically with substance use disorder um, specifically. And so there's me. I'm Olivia. Um, I have an MBA and my MSW both from WVU. And I've been with our department for eight years. And I am a crazy cat lady. Um, I have six of them and I have to very much so refrain from taking on any more. And it is a very large challenge on most occasions. So that is, um, sorry, that is very much so me in a nutshell. Um, I also really love vintage things. Uh, most of my office is very much so vintage. So why is communication so important? Um, communication is incredibly important um, because it's how you build connection um, and it's how you understand those around you um, and how others understand you. And building connection is the basis for all relationships um, and interactions. So just a refresher, right? So some basics on communication. Four main types, right? You have verbal, which is what we're doing now. What I'm doing now is talking. Um, you have nonverbal, which is going to be your body language, your tone, um, inflection, things like that, facial expressions. You have visual, which is my PowerPoint, right? Visual aids. And then written communication. Um, with that, you also have your informal and formal processes. Um, and so things, and then there are multiple more, which I won't get into because there's 15 plus different subcategories. Um, so communication is very intricate, um, very, very intricate. And it's going to be largely based on the environment, who you're communicating with, and their experiences, and the noise within the environment. And so all of those things have to be accounted for, or we attempt to account for them. But there's still a large area where miscommunication can happen. So then we have the seven principles um, of communication and so guidelines for how to help cut down on that noise, how to help make sure that your intended message is the one that is being perceived by the person on the other end which is your correctness, clarity, conciseness, completeness, consideration, courtesy, and concreteness. And so making sure that when you're communicating, you're looking at, is the information that I have correct? Am I saying it in a way that is clear? Am I giving the whole picture, the whole story, um, and so on. With that, um, grammar actually plays a really large part in verbal communication and where we fit those pauses, where we fit 
different inflections um, and how we change our tone through when we communicate different things. And so some general barriers, um, you know, information overload is a really big one that sometimes kind of gets looked over because everybody is gonna have a different threshold for overload, what is too much. Um, and that largely comes in the form of questions. So when you're asking a lot of questions, in a small amount of time, or just a lot of questions in general. Um, that can be very overwhelming. And so that can cause one of those big barriers. Another one is language. And that can be, you know, different primary language, different first language, but that can also be a different style of language. You know, if you go to um, more urban places, you're going to have completely different language where you don't always know what some of the things that are being said mean. Different words are used for different things, different um, phrasings. And so that can get in the way of really being able to communicate what your message is. So specifically looking at substance use disorder and communication, there are a few things that are a little bit unique to substance use disorder and really it can apply to mental illness in general um, in a lot of ways, but there are certain things to consider and to be more aware of. And so there's additional barriers, um, which make it a lot more difficult and a lot more convoluted. Um, and so one of the big ones is obviously stigma, but you also have piled up emotions. And so when you're trying to communicate with someone, who has piled up emotions combined with impulsivity and lack of emotional regulation, you know, or a decreased ability to regulate those emotions, that's going to make that really difficult. And it's largely going to be perceived in the wrong way. Um, Another one is trauma and re-traumatization. And so looking at that, you know, it creates sometimes this disconnect. And so sometimes information isn't always digested or it's looked at through the lens of their trauma and their experience with that. And it can be perceived not necessarily. Um, how it's intended. And so being very aware of the words you choose and the way you choose to put them together and articulate those um, are really helpful, as well as using language that's appropriate for the receiver. And kind of what I mean by that is if I'm coming in and using complex terms, and terms that they don't understand, that's gonna put them into, that's going to put anyone into information overload. That's going to decrease the engagement, increase distractibility, and create much more noise um, because there is less focus and less connection to what is being communicated. And so a couple things um, that really help with the therapeutic communication um, with these barriers, clear boundaries. 
um, and clear communication with what you're saying. Consistency. You know, and that goes along with making sure and thinking through what what your intention is with your message before articulating that. Um, so you're able to, to be consistent with what you're saying. Accepting of individuality. You know, everyone's going to be a little bit different. I mean, my PowerPoints are a clear case of that. Right, everybody's gonna have their, their little way to do things. And accepting that and those individual little pieces of that person, allowing them to tell their story their way and how they perceived the situations is gonna be extremely helpful in having your message perceived correctly because then that creates connection. That creates that foundation of trust. I'm welcome, I'm comfortable, and I'm safe. Um, you want to avoid generalizations, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of that, let them be their individual self. Um, another really good way to to help with this is demonstrate understanding. Um, and so you can do that by asking for clarification, you know, reframing and summarizing and repeating it back and making sure that there is not miscommunication on your end by perception. And so taking the time to make sure that you understand what they're saying to you. Because substance use disorder and in general, right, mental illness, sometimes the way that what you're feeling is articulated is not always what you mean. And so that creates added noise. So making sure that you're hearing what they're saying um, is really important. Being really genuine with your interactions. I think we all know that when we're not genuine, they will call us out right away, every single time. And so being genuine, can't fake it. They know, and they will immediately call you out, or at least everybody I've interacted with calls me out on it. But goes a long way, right? Think about when you go to the doctor, or when you go to meet somebody new and you're having an interaction and they're genuine, big difference. You walk away feeling very different than you would if you had an interaction that wasn't genuine and where you didn't feel understood or didn't feel heard. Um, and so these things, although they seem little, they go a really big way in helping open communication. You know, and at the end of the day, the biggest piece is when doing all of this, you create safety. And that's gonna create trust, which ultimately is gonna help with noise because then you're gonna have more ability to be direct, I guess, or a little bit more clear in your communication. Right? When you have a limited trust of somebody, you're going to dance around certain situations because you don't know how to say it. It's uncomfortable. Um, and so these are ways to help kind of get that and build that communication. And then listening. So listening is a whole other component 
you know, not only for our side being providers, case managers, therapists, but also for patients and looking at what are they hearing? What are they getting from what I'm saying? And making sure that it's understood. And you can see my little headphones on my heart. I thought he was really cute. And so active listening is huge. This page is a lot, but really the biggest thing is active listening. You know, you want to really pay attention to what someone is saying, get clarity, reflect on it, summarize it, you know, all of those things that I've mentioned in before, but the largest one is no judgment. Um, and so being able to take the information that you're being given as a you know provider in some way, shape or form and not putting anything into it, taking it for what it is. And sitting with it. Um, you know, all of these are really help with active listening, but your no judgment is gonna go a long way. Um, you know, clarify, also mm -hmm. incredibly important because that's how you perceive the information. And if you perceive it incorrectly, then moving forward, communication is going to be more difficult because whatever piece of information, if things build from that or build on that, you have a piece of misinformation coming your way. And barriers with listening. And this is more so, you know, things that we're gonna see when communicating with clients and, and patients on a regular basis. You know, a lot of listening is done, but you know, with looking at these barriers, evaluative listening, um, you know, it's when you're going to be most likely to miss critical information. Um, it, you know, they're the person that is gonna be constantly agreeing or disagreeing um, quickly with what's being said. Um, you know, the person that's kind of glazed over and uh-huh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, you know, it's also the most likely to end up in disagreements because of that lack of understanding because it's under evaluation. Everything that is being taken in is being immediately evaluated. You have self-protective listening. Um, so focused on communicating your perspective with your emotions that you're not open to what the other person is telling you back. Um, and so any alternative interpretation is absolutely a no. You know, you're protecting your perspective. You have the 
sumptive listening, which is the most difficult um, of the listening to kind of work through. Um, you know, it's, you put your assumptions into the situation. You know, it's exactly what it sounds like in that way. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what the other person is wanting from us and not what they're actually saying. Judgmental listening, right? Exactly kind of what it sounds like. Um, you're criticizing all the information that is coming to you, picking it apart um, and not necessarily taking it in for what it is and being able to absorb um, what may be coming your direction. The affirmative listening, they, you know, focusing solely on speaking their point of view and not listening to any different views. Um, wanting to be affirmed or validated. And so a lot of information that can be communicated is missed because they want a, their part validated, um, which can be difficult to have a conversation where you're trying to have different sides of the story. And then defensive listening. Um, the yeah, but. And so, you know, they take everything as a personal attack or, you know, wanting to justify or defend everything that, that their perspective is because they're feeling as though it's being invalidated um, and not understood. And defensive listening, um, you know, also is very difficult um, because it's hard to, it's hard to communicate with someone and explain that you're not personally attacking them when they're feeling that way. And so it's one of the, one of the ones that's really hard to work through in the moment, um, because it causes the most emotions in the moment because you're feeling personally attacked. Um, and so knowing and being aware of those and, and what kind of listening is happening um, can help you use some of those previous tools to work around it, to overcome some of those challenges and barriers so that what is being intended is actually being perceived. You know, the intended message is making it all the way through. And the noise isn't necessarily impacting it in a way that is going to cause a shift in the meat of the message being misinterpreted. And that's it. Awesome job. Thank you so much. And it was so colorful. You were right. <laughs> Visually pleasing. And I love the tree ones, like the tree of communication versus tree of life. So I kind of like that. But does anybody have any comments or questions or any stories regarding experiences and shifting your way of communicating maybe with somebody?
All right, Jeremy. <laughs> you want me to say something, Olivia, or no? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, we had an example earlier today on the DDU of just uh, communication and problems. Um, so we had a guy that spent two weeks at Shepherd Pratt and um, two weeks, this guy just lost uh, his half his foot and his uh, left lower leg to amputation. And he's in a wheelchair now. So somebody who's young and healthy and now he's disabled for the rest of his life. Um, and he spent two weeks in Shepherd Pratt and he, was a, you know, he has a lot of trauma and a lot of addiction, but um, when I, uh, when we were talking about him before we saw him, I was just hearing all these things about how horrible he was and blah, 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 and how he was, you know, mean to everybody, blah, blah, blah. And then we, we actually saw him and it really wasn't that it was just, he was kind of fed up with the system and how he was being treated and how they did not listen to him for two weeks. And they were kind of lying to him in patient service, not providing him treatments or saying they would and they didn't. And within five minutes, it went from, you guys are the enemy to, Hey, you know, I want to get better and thanks for helping me. So it, it can make a big difference depending on how you communicate with people. And, you know, um, you can have people stonewall and never want treatment again versus getting them to really buy into their care. And uh, next thing you know, you develop therapeutic rapport and you know, they're off to the races in a good way. So now it's an important thing. And, and often we uh, kind of devalue uh, how important it is to be able to communicate with people. Um, but yeah, I, I remember, um, I remember medical school, one of the oncologists, he said, uh, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So that one always stuck with me. And it's a, it's a good, wise word to live by. So thanks for the message. Oh, Jeremy, I love that. That's powerful. I want to write that down. I, I try to remember, I try to keep in mind, I forget sometimes when I'm meeting a patient or we're meeting patients for the first time that just because I'm being nice and I'm trying to communicate that I'm caring, there's a good chance that they have met other people in this field prior to coming to my office who were not very nice and who maybe didn't really care or at least didn't communicate that they care. So if there's walls up, I, I, you know, that's they sort of have every right to have those up based on the experiences they've had prior to coming to us. So sometimes I can lose track of that and I need to remember that. I just assume everybody else does a terrible job and that that makes it a little bit easier on how to approach people. So. Let's Probably one way to do that, yeah. Olivia, great job. Thanks so much for the comments and thank you for sharing. <laughs> All right, well, if you don't have anything else, I just have one announcement and the upcoming session will take place on October 24th with Laura Lander discussing CPS involvement with patients. So stay tuned and I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thank you so much.